When you think of molecules, nutrients, drugs, whatever, that extend lifespan, what do you think of? Maybe you've heard of a few, maybe you can't think of any off the top of your head, but in this video, we'll be going over a few molecules that are claimed to do exactly that. Additionally, I'll provide the science and the mechanisms so that we get clear on these popular molecules. As with other videos in this anti-aging series, we'll be using an economist video on lifespan as the backbone of our investigation. If you haven't seen the other videos in this series, that's A-OK, -okay. you don't need to. Although I would love to see you and your lovely face there as well. So I'll link them for you if you're interested. But let's begin with what is at hand. But this isn't the only class of drug that shows promise in slowing aging. This one is metformin. It's been also taken off-label for longevity purposes. Metformin is a common drug to treat diabetes, but also the people who are using that are protected against a variety of age-related diseases. Metformin mimics dietary restriction by lessening the amount of sugar the body produces and absorbs. Okay, who had metformin on their bingo card? Well, smarty pants, good call. Or we'll see, actually. But I wanted to point out that I think it's incorrect to say that we don't understand how metformin works. We know that it has several mechanisms of action, but on blood sugar lowering front, it acts on the liver, inhibiting the liver's ability to generate sugar through a process called gluconeogenesis. Additionally, it, oh, Wait, you weren't satisfied with that? Oh, you want us to go subcellular? All right, very well, smarty pants. Let's go subcellular. Of these multiple mechanisms, metformin is known to inhibit an enzyme called glycerol 3 phosphate dehydrogenase, which we shall henceforth name GPD, because no one has time for me to repeat the full name over and over again. Anyway, this enzyme is responsible for taking gluconeogenesis substrates, aka molecules that can be used to convert into sugar and allow them to be converted to sugar. More specifically, it converts glycerol from triglycerides into dihydroxyacetone, phosphate, or DHAP, D-H-A-P. And for the biochemists out there, yes, I know that I skipped a step. This DHAP can then be used in the gluconeogenic metabolism and spit out sugar into the bloodstream, keeping blood sugar high. However, metformin blocks the enzyme that does this conversion, the GPD enzyme mentioned earlier, thereby reducing the available substrate that's then available for gluconeogenesis. But metformin also acts on AMPK, a master protein in our cells that has tremendous impact on the reactions within our cells. AMPK is a major player in activating our cells to take up glucose, blood sugar, from the bloodstream and into our cells. Metformin happens to activate an upstream enzyme that activates AMPK by tagging it via phosphorylation, known as LKB. Metformin activates LKB, which tags AMPK, which activates AMPK to stimulate movement of glucose transporters to the surface of the cell, like in muscle, and take up glucose out of the bloodstream. So through reduced gluconeogenesis and increased glucose uptake, metformin improves blood sugar levels. That's two major mechanisms, but metformin also has effects on mitochondria. The point is, while there are several mechanisms, we aren't altogether too confused about metformin's actual actions. At least, these researchers aren't. Anyway, I hope your mechanistic sweet tooth has been placated. Let's listen on. The way it works inside a cell isn't completely understood, but it reduces inflammation and helps break down accumulated rubbish. In studies, diabetics taking metformin have lived longer and healthier than people not on the drug, whether they were diabetic or not. Okay, that snippet actually contained a lot of material. First off, metformin increases autophagy through AMPK as well. The mechanism is slightly different, but we've already gone over how metformin activates AMPK, so we'll leave that one. How about the life extension effects of metformin, though? Well, this is a fascinating story that I had to do quite a bit of digging into. 
One study took the world by storm when it showed that people with diabetes that were taking metformin outlived people who did not have diabetes and did not take metformin. The data looked like this. The lower the line goes, the worse the mortality, aka more people dying. The green line, although it's tough to see, is the metformin group. And the black line is the people that are not on metformin. It's subtle, but the green line slightly outperforms the black line, showing a small benefit of metformin on fighting mortality compared to non-diabetic individuals. You can understand why this was such an impactful study. That's diabetics outperforming non-diabetics. Is diabetes good for us? <laughs> of course not. Here's where I can credit Dr. Peter Atia for turning me on to this study that redid the previous study that I just mentioned. These researchers did not find the same results. As a matter of fact, they found quite the opposite. People who did not have diabetes and did not take metformin had better mortality than diabetic metformin users, as seen here. The lighter line is the diabetics on metformin, and the darker line are the people without diabetes. The difference is large. So, why the disagreement in results? Well, the first study had a major confounding variable because the study was restricted to people who had diabetes, but were only taking metformin. However, since diabetes is normally progressive, people usually have to get on more drugs than just metformin thereby eliminating them from the analysis, since the analysis was restricted to only metformin users, no other drugs allowed. As such, the numbers are artificially in favor of people who would survive in the diabetic group, because those with the highest risk of dying were being plucked out of the analysis. Just to be clear, there's nothing malicious that was going on here. These were the standards set at the beginning of the study. There were some other confounding factors, but uh, this was really the major one. The second study repeated the methods, but this time they controlled for that problem, as well as went a few steps further in ways that I'll get into in other content. So it seems more likely that diabetes is worse for causing mortality than metformin is good for fighting mortality, at least. So where does that leave you then? Well, there are a number of standing questions, unfortunately. Questions like, does metformin increase lifespan in people without diabetes? There aren't many studies looking at metformin for prophylactic use, but animal studies show a life extension effect. But it seems likely that metformin extends life in diabetics compared to people who don't use metformin, even if they were to use other methods. So, while metformin isn't quite as exciting for the general population as it once was, it could still hold promise. We just need more studies, especially directly towards people who use it without diabetes. Metformin isn't the only molecule that's been shown to have benefit. There's also rapamycin. Another drug that seems to slow aging is rapamycin, already approved for use with organ transplants. Rapamycin is an immunosuppressant. It changes the way that nutrients are, are sensed and changes the way that they're metabolized in ways which are useful to extending life. Rapamycin boosts the way cells clear up junk that builds up inside them with age. This means they can function better, like a younger version of themselves. Rapamycin is a molecule that works opposite of metformin. Remember how we discussed metformin activating AMPK? Well, rapamycin inhibits AMPK's evil brother, mTOR. mTOR is a master protein that is associated with growth, and when mTOR is active, AMPK is normally turned off or inactive. Since so many diseases are linked to growth, uh, think cancer, uh, certain heart diseases, uh, chronic inflammation, really all kinds and more, and all of that is mediated through at least partly mTOR, it makes sense that blocking mTOR would lead to improved overall health and lifespan. Not only that, inhibiting mTOR typically also activates AMPK, which can increase autophagy. Well, I was going to get into it earlier when discussing metformin, but I suppose, well, we can touch on it here. Rapamycin inhibits mTOR, which normally inhibits AMPK, which normally activates a protein called ULK. 
ULK is responsible for the first steps of autophagy by phosphorylating, tagging, another protein called Beclin. I'm not going to go through the entire cascade, but you see the point. If we can stop mTOR from blocking AMPK, then AMPK is free to activate autophagy within the cells. Autophagy is this self-eating process, or in uh, less cannibalistic terms, a process by which your cells take up dysfunctional components and eliminate them, called autophagy. But I don't want this to be autophagy-centric. Uh, the inhibition of mTOR can also reduce expression of pro-inflammatory genes, reduce rates of cancer growth if cancer is present, reduce the pathological growth of the heart, and much more. This is another molecule that in animal studies, a lot of them has been shown to have life extension effects. For example, this study, the researchers did something unique in that they gave mice rapamycin in old age. And as seen here, the red line is the rapamycin treated mice, and the blue is the control. The vertical axis is the percent of mice that are still alive, so the higher the better. The horizontal axis is the amount of time. You can see that the arrows indicate when the mice were given rapamycin. And clearly the red group, the treatment group, had more mice live longer. Let me tell you, 1200 days for a mouse is extremely long. We're talking end age. Hopefully you're a LOTR fan. At the time of this recording, there aren't many human trials, but there are a few. For example, topical rapamycin has been used to see if it'll eliminate senescent cells. This is the point where I would interject and mention that we have a video in this series on senescence and zombie cells and how they affect longevity. I'll link it for you. The results were encouraging as rapamycin applied to the skin did reduce one common marker of senescence as seen here, P16 protein. And yes, I'm looking at you if you know what that is from the senescence video which is a marker of senescence that was then reduced. There were also a few other positive results related to skin aging, like increased collagen. There was another study looking at the consumption of rapamycin to determine safety, and they did show a few differences in blood markers related to immune cells. But the study was so small, it's really difficult to get any meaningful conclusions beyond it won't kill you instantly, or over four months, which is the study duration. I'll release more detailed content on rapamycin in the future once more human data is available. Like I mentioned though, this is one of many videos in the longevity series. If you feel that you've learned something, uh, I would recommend checking out the full playlist right here. And thank you for sticking it out with me. I'll speak with you in the next one.